Hello friends, I am Dr. Nilesh Chandra and we will be discussing the questions from NEET exam 2020, the questions which landed up in the biochemistry section. So, we will take a quick look at the questions that were probably there, uh, the possible options uh, which were there and which one would be the best option to mark in the given questions. So, let us take a quick look at the questions and their answers. So, first few questions from the acid base balance starting with this question. The lab report of a patient uh, given below pH is 7.2, the bicarbonate is 10 molecule per liter, and the PCO2 is 30 millimeter of mercury. And the question says this exemplifies which of the following disorder your options are respiratory acidosis, alkalosis, metabolic acidosis and metabolic alkalosis. Now very frequently we get the question of this sort in your exam. So what you have to keep in mind generally in these questions you will get uh, three values. You will get the pH. Obviously the pH will help us to determine whether we are looking at acidosis or we are looking at alkalosis. After pH you will get two more values. First, the bicarbonate value and second, the PCO2 value. Now, here you should know the approximate normal values uh, for them and uh, for bicarbonate, it would be typically in the range of 22 to uh, 28 milli equivalent per liter. For one value, we can go with uh, 24 milli equivalent per liter. Similarly, for PCO2, the range would be uh, 35 to 45 millimeter of Hg, but if you want one value, we can go with the 40 millimeter of Hg. This should be the normal value. If it is uh, uh, increased, obviously, value will be more than P, uh, the given uh, normal values, and accordingly, it will be decreased. Now, what does the bicarbonate denote and what does PCO2 denote? See, the PCO2 will give rise to the H plus concentration alright. So, if there is increase in PCO2 there will be corresponding increase in H plus concentration and the bicarbonate will neutralize the H plus. So, if you have more bicarbonate you will have less H plus alright and we know that H plus will determine the pH more is the H plus, less will be the pH, means more H plus means acidosis, less H plus means alkalosis. Now, keeping these three points in mind, we can quickly determine what uh, we are going to find. Now, pH normal value, you again know that it is in the range of 7.35 to 7.45 and we normally say it is 7.4, the mean pH value of the blood would be 7.4. So, first you look at pH. Normal value should be 7.4, here we get 7.2. This means we are looking at acidosis. It is acidic in nature, so we are looking at acidosis. Now, acidosis means the H plus concentration should be increased. The increase in H plus can occur in two ways. Either there is increase in PCO2, right? Or there is decrease in the bicarbonate because the bicarbonate and H plus have uh, opposite relationship, inverse relationship. So, if the bicarbonate will decrease, H plus will increase. The PCO2 and H plus we said have a direct relationship, the PCO2 will rise, the H plus will also rise. So, these are two possibilities. Now, you look at which of the following changes has occurred in the question. PCO2 increase has it occurred? Let us see, PCO2 has not increased, it has decreased. So, this would be, this would be not the cause for increase in H plus. What about bicarbonate? The bicarbonate has it decreased or increased? It should decrease to increase H plus and here we find that it has decreased. So, this should be the primary cause, the acidosis and because there is drop in bicarbonate level, it should be the metabolic acidosis, it should be the metabolic acidosis. So, like I said, the metabolic acidosis. 
quickly we can put it in a graph form to recall it better we look at the ph value it can either be less than normal or it can be more than normal if it is normal we don't have to do anything but if it is less than normal or more than normal then we have to determine whether the acidosis or alkalosis is there and what type of acidosis or alkalosis is there second part would be compensation which i'll mention very briefly so in first scenario if the ph is less than 7.4 we say it is acidosis two possibilities either it can be metabolic in nature or it can be respiratory metabolic means the bicarbonate value will change and respiratory means the pco2 value will change so if bicarbonate value is less than 24 then means we are looking at a metabolic cause and simultaneously if there is the decrease in pco2 value also it is to compensate for the acidosis so if both bicarbonate and pco2 decrease this means the cause is metabolic and compensation is provided by the respiratory mechanism opposite scenario if the pco2 is increased then we are looking at a respiratory cause and simultaneously if the bicarbonate is also increased it is the compensation component so these are the two scenarios metabolic and respiratory acidosis they may or may not have the corresponding compensation to correct for the acid base disturbance similarly if the ph value is more than 7.4 then we are looking at alkalosis if bicarbonate value has increased it is the primary cause we are looking at metabolic acidosis and if the pco2 has also increased in that case it is compensation if there is no change in pco2 it in the normal value no compensation if it has increased then only we will say that compensation is there and if the pco2 has decreased the primary cause will be respiratory and if there is change in the bicarbonate that is there is decrease in bicarbonate then it will constitute the compensation so using this graph we can quickly determine what type of acid base balance is there and whether or not any compensation is occurring okay so this helps us to quickly determine the acid base disorders uh, very frequently in the clinical scenarios we don't need to work this out because most of the time we can have a handbook you can have any handbook which has this graph called the Devonport we have a graph called the Devonport diagram and it just put in the values for the parameters the bicarbonate value the blood pH and the pco2 value put in the three values and you can quickly read out from this graph the type of acid base disturbance all right so these are few points which you have to keep in mind sometimes rarely you may be asked about uh, uh, the difference in anion and cation which is known as anion gap but that is a different scenario altogether okay moving on to second question again from uh, the acid base disturbance in this case what is given clinical presentation a 55 year old male presents with tachypnea and mental confusion okay blood glucose level is 350 milligram per deciliter so blood glucose level is high in addition the ph is 7 ph is 7 means we are looking at a type of acidosis now in uh, diabetic patients is there any type of acidosis yes we have what is known as diabetic ketoacidosis if it were diabetic ketoacidosis the ketone bodies will be formed and they will appear in urine so in next case it is given urine shows the presence of ketone bodies so we are looking at diabetic ketoacidosis and this diabetic ketoacidosis is a, a type of metabolic disorder because there is defect in the metabolism because of which ketone bodies are rising and it is therefore a metabolic acidosis so this is a uh, straightforward question which even in which you don't need to go into the values of uh, the bicarbonate and pco2 simply by looking at the clinical scenario we can depict what is the primary cause for the acidosis okay moving on to next question now we're coming to some questions from carbohydrates the question was among these insoluble dietary fiber is first what is dietary fiber dietary fiber polysaccharide in the diet 
which is not metabolized right so polysaccharide in diet which is not metabolized all of these all of the options are dietary fibers but the question says insoluble among them which is the insoluble now here there is some confusion because two of them are insoluble lignin as well as hemicellulose both are somewhat insoluble but still the better answer would be lignin lignin is the better answer if you have to choose one that lignin is the insoluble dietary fiber because it doesn't go any uh, significant change it cannot be digested it cannot be broken down by the anaerobic bacteria bacteria also in the gut so lignin would be the preferred answer among the two if lignin is not there in that case we can choose the hemicellulose also okay another question from uh, the carbohydrate chemistry the proteoglycan present in a glomerular basement membrane and various options are there keratin sulfate 1 2 heparin sulfate and chondroitin sulfate now this is one topic i always say that it is likely to land up in your exam location of the different proteoglycans or the glycose amino glycans the glycose amino glycan combine with proteins and the result is the proteoglycan so whether you talk about the location of the glycose amino glycan or the proteoglycan it is somewhat similar let's take a quick look at the small table showing the presence of the different glycose amino glycan in the specific tissues in this case for a reference the answer is heparin sulfate heparin sulfate is found in the glomerular basement membrane so hyaluronic acid the most common glycose amino glycan it is present in the synovial fluid the vitreous humor and the loose connective tissue most widespread glycose amino glycan is the hyaluronic acid please note glycose amino glycan are also known as mucopolysaccharides they are also known as the mucopolysaccharides then we come to the chondroitin sulfate chondroitin sulfate is present in the cartilage bone and in the cornea keratin sulfate 1 is also present in cornea just like chondroitin sulfate and keratin sulfate 2 present in the loose connective tissue all right heparin released by the mast cells and heparin sulfate is present in the skin fibroblast the aortic wall and the glomerular basement membrane dermatin sulfate again it has wide distribution commonly present in the skin and the other connective tissue so dermatin sulfate is also having the wide distribution so these are the seven important common glycose amino glycan that you have to know about and one or two tissues where they are commonly present in significant amounts okay moving on to another question from the carbohydrates the insulin glucagon ratio is decreased which of the following enzyme will be most active now this is a tricky question very frequently we get the question on the insulin glucagon ratio the action of insulin the action of glucagon what will happen in fasting state what will happen in the fed state what is happening in uh, which enzyme is activated in phosphorylated form which enzyme is activated in the dephosphorylated form like that question will keep coming again and again there is a very simple mechanism by which we can solve these questions. I will quickly mention that how to handle them. The insulin glucagon ratio, if you write like this insulin glucagon ratio. Now we know that the insulin and glucagon have a reciprocal relationship. What we mean by reciprocal relationship? insulin increases glucagon will fall if insulin falls glucagon will increase all right now if insulin increases the glucagon will decrease reciprocal relationship so what is happening numerator has increased denominator has decreased what will happen to the net value the net value will also increase more numerator less denominator the net value will increase let's look at another scenario insulin decreases what will happen to glucagon glucagon will increase reciprocal relationship so what happened numerator has decreased denominator has increased what will happen to the net value the net value will become less now very interesting observation if you look carefully if insulin increases 
the insulin glucagon ratio also increases. If insulin decreases, the insulin glucagon ratio also decreases. So, when you look at a question telling you insulin glucagon ratio, for the purpose of the question, don't look at the glucagon ratio, just read it as insulin is increased. Ratio will only increase when insulin will increase. All right. So, now we should only know the action of insulin. If you know the action of insulin, you will be able to tell the questions for the insulin glucagon ratio. Second point, when will insulin rise? When there is more glucose means fed state. When will insulin fall? When there is low glucose, that means you are looking at fasting state. So, when I say fasting, it means low insulin. When I say fed state, it means more insulin. And if you know the action of insulin, then you can quickly tell us what is going to happen. All right. So, again, the second fasting and fed is also converted to action of insulin. Third, insulin mostly causes, mostly causes dephosphorylation. Remember this point insulin mostly causes dephosphorylation and now we come to the actions of insulin on the different pathways after which the picture will become very very clear okay for this case the answer is glucose 6 phosphatase we'll come back to that action of insulin it increases glycolysis it increases glycogenesis it increases lipogenesis it increases hmp shunt it increases amino acid synthesis and cholesterol synthesis so effectively what it does it increases glucose consumption and this should be obvious why because insulin increases only when there is increase in the glucose so action of insulin is to decrease the glucose by consumption at the same time at the same time insulin also decreases the the glycogenolysis it decreases the lipolysis it decreases the gluconeogenesis and it decreases the ketogenesis meaning it decreases new fuel formation and the fuel are glucose, the ketone bodies and the fatty acid. So, any mechanism by which these will become available is prevented, it is prevented by the action of insulin. Now, what we said? the insulin mostly causes dephosphorylation meaning the enzymes of these pathway are active in dephosphorylated form and similarly the enzymes here are inactive they are inactive in dephosphorylated form this will cover most of the enzymes related to metabolic pathway when you look at enzyme you can quickly ascribe it to a particular metabolic pathway and by remembering this table you can quickly determine what will happen to enzyme activity in a phosphorylated state and what will happen to enzyme activity in the dephosphorylated state this is a simple simplified version to remember the activity of most of the enzymes the metabolic pathways when they will be activated when they will be inactivated what happens when there is change in the insulin glucagon ratio what happens in the fed state what happens in the fasting state so looking at the previous question if you go back if you go back you will find the question says insulin glucagon ratio is decreased this means the insulin will will decrease this means whichever pathways are normally decreased by insulin will now be activated and whichever pathways are normally activated by insulin will now be decreased glucokinase part of the uh, glycolysis or the glycogen synthesis which is normally activated by insulin so will be decreased hexokinase again same decreased phosphatokinase again for glycolysis it will be decreased glucose 6 phosphatase belongs to the gluconeogenesis 
and we said new fuel formation is inhibited by insulin if there is less insulin new fuel formation will increase and that is why the glucose 6-phosphatase will be activated when insulin glucagon ratio is less okay moving on to next question <coughs> now this question is from the lipid section in a preterm baby with a respiratory distress syndrome which of the following lipid would be deficient now all of you know the answer to this question is lecithin to be more precise it is dipamitoyl lecithin but what you have to know is lecithin the more correct name for lecithin is the phosphatidylcholine so the correct answer is dipamitoyl phosphatidylcholine there was another question in the exam which was asking about the type of cell which is not mature so you should remember the phosphatidylcholine is being produced by the pneumocytes type 2 so in the preterm baby these type of cells are not mature and that is why the dipamitoyl lecithin formation is not sufficient giving rise to the respiratory distress syndrome both the questions have come what is less and which cell is not mature the pneumocyte 2 question belongs to the physiology section so i have not taken that up okay another question and this is a very important question because the metabolic syndrome is currently a hot topic the ncp atp3 criteria is for metabolic syndrome and you should know the parameters the which are included in the metabolic syndrome criteria so the question says which of the following is not included in metabolic syndrome and the options are hypertriglyceridemia high ldl central obesity and hypertension please note in this case the answer happens to be high ldl this is very important to remember that in the definition of metabolic syndrome ldl is not included ldl is not a part of the definition of metabolic syndrome so what is a part of metabolic syndrome let's take a quick look as per ncp atp3 definition metabolic syndrome is present if three or more of the following criteria are met out of these one is essential we will start only if this criteria is there and that is west circumference more than 40 inches or 90 centimeter in males and more than 35 inches or 80 centimeter in the female this is essential only if this is there then we can apply the other criteria if it is not there we cannot apply the other criteria we will not be talking about the metabolic syndrome now two or more among four different criteria should be there blood pressure systolic more than equal to 135 millimeter of mercury diastolic more than equal to 85 millimeter of mercury the fasting triglyceride more than equal to 150 milligram per deciliter the fasting hdl in case of female less than 50 milligram per deciliter in case of male the value is less that is 40 milligram per deciliter and lastly the fasting blood sugar more than equal to 100 milligram per deciliter okay so essential criteria and two or more of the remaining four if they are present then we call it the metabolic syndrome metabolic syndrome has been associated with a large number of diseases and that is why this definition is very 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 important you must know about the criteria which is included in the metabolic syndrome it is likely to be asked again and again and now now we move on to the enzyme section true about non competitive inhibition is now here we are talking about the change in enzyme activity due to different type of inhibitors very briefly i'll mention the type of inhibitors the inhibitors can be two broad types they can be reversible and they can be irreversible please note mostly in your exam the question will focus on the reversible type because it is only the reversible type where we can have a sub pharmacological management to re remove the action of inhibitor in irreversible type only symptomatic management is there so clinically it is not very significant most of the questions will focus on the reversible type of inhibitors the reversible type of inhibitors will be of three subtypes competitive non competitive and uncompetitive please note non competitive is a special subtype of a category called the mixed inhibitor but the exam will only ask about the non competitive type 
I'll quickly give you the important points about the three. First, what happens to Km? In case of commutative, the Km increases. Alright. In B, the Km remains the same in non commutative and in uncommutative the km decreases i'm sure you know what is km km denotes uh, the uh, affinity between the enzyme and the substrate km and affinity have a reciprocal relationship means more affinity less km less affinity more km then we have the value of vmax in case of commutative inhibition the vmax will remain the same in case of non commutative and in uncommutative inhibition the vmax will decrease last point to keep in mind, mind is the point of attachment where the inhibitor will go and attach on the enzyme in case of commutative inhibition it attaches at the active site in case of non commutative inhibition it attaches at the allosteric site but most important and different is the point of attachment for uncommutative inhibition where the inhibitor attaches only to the enzyme substrate complex so these are the three points which you have to keep in mind the change in came the change in vmax and the point of attachment of the inhibitor in case of the three different types of the reversible inhibition they are the competitive non competitive and uncompetitive these are the three different types of inhibitors under the reversible inhibitor category we have to know the changes now when we say non competitive inhibition what happens the km will remain the same and the vmax will decrease so the correct answer should be a the vmax remains the same sorry vmax decreases and the km remains the same okay moving on to next question replacing alanine by which amino acid will increase uv absorption of protein now we are moving into the protein section amino acid and protein section the options are tryptophan leucine proline and arginine now what we have to understand here the absorption at 280 nanometer or in the uv range occurs by aromatic compounds so here you should know which are the aromatic amino acids the aromatic amino acids are tyrosine phenylalanine histidine and tryptophan so if you know the aromatic amino acids immediately you can give the answer that absorption at 280 nanometer will increase only when we add an aromatic amino acid among the given option the only aromatic amino acid is the tryptophan so the correct answer should be tryptophan tryptophan if replace replaces any other amino acid the resulting protein will have increased absorption at the 280 nanometer in the uv range then we have question asking about the synthesis of one of these special products the nitric oxide nitric oxide is synthesized from which of the amino acids now frequently you'll get questions talking about special products and the source from which they are coming in this case nitric oxide is synthesized from arginine by the enzyme nitric oxide synthase we know that nitric oxide is a second messenger it helps in the relaxation of the various muscles particularly in the blood vessels and it is a very important a second messenger let's take a look at some of the other important special products and from where which amino acid are they coming the tyrosine gives rise to multiple special products first and foremost the catecholamine 
in the adrenal medulla the catecholamine meaning the dopamine norepinephrine epinephrine come from the tyrosine in the thyroid gland they give rise to the thyroxine hormones the t3 and t4 so tyrosine gives rise to the catecholamines it gives rise to the thyroxine hormones and in the melanocytes it gives rise to the melanin it gives rise to the melanin first dopa is formed and then it is converted to melanin so tyrosine gives rise to the catecholamines to the thyroxine hormones and the melanin then you come to tryptophan tryptophan gives rise to melatonin serotonin and niacin niacin meaning vitamin b3 please remember 60 milligram of tryptophan is consumed to generate 1 milligram of niacin 60 milligram tryptophan will give rise to 1 milligram of niacin then from arginine we just said nitric oxide is obtained from histidine and from glutamate uh, we get the corresponding molecules histamine and gaba both are produced by the decarboxylation of the parent amino acid by decarboxylation of histidine you get the histamine by decarboxylation of glutamate you get the gaba gaba means the gamma amino butyric acid the gamma amino butyric acid gaba obtained from glutamate so these are some of the very important special products obtained from the different amino acids which you should know okay now we move on to some of the very important clinical questions which were there in the exam long questions we, all of you know that long clinical questions were there in the neat exam this year okay first question four year old boy of a first degree consanguineous couple so when we say consanguineous couple what we are trying to emphasize is uh, there will be likelihood of increased incidence of autosomal recessive disorders more likelihood of autosomal recessive disorders it was noted by parents to have darkening of urine to an almost black color when it was left standing so blackening of urine on standing normal siblings and no other associated medical problems growth and development to date are normal now this is a very special scenario where although there is blackening of urine in the uh, child there is no associated clinical signs symptoms until the third and fourth decade of life at that time there are various clinical presentations but before that there is no other clinical presentation except blackening of urine on standing the condition is known as l captonuria the condition is known as l captonuria and the enzyme defect in l captonuria is homogenesate oxidase the enzyme defect is homogenesate oxidase in the third and fourth decade they will present with another set of problems they will have back pain on examination you will find that there is stiffness of the back they will have early onset erosive arthritis early onset erosive arthritis because the homogenesic acid crystals will be there in the synovial fluid whenever there is movement on the joints the crystal will rub the synovial membrane resulting in erosive arthritis and what is known as ochronosis this is blackening of the skin over various parts of the body this is known as ochronosis is again because the deposited homogenesic acid gradually gets oxidized over years and decades in the atmosphere partial pressure of oxygen is high so quick oxidation in the body partial pressure of oxygen is low so oxidation takes a very long time so the blackening occurs over decades so ochronosis is the blackening of the deposited homogenesic acid all of this will appear in a third and fourth decade before that there are no other signs symptoms except darkening of urine on standing in case of l captonuria l captonuria belongs to a group of cluster of disorders in the phenylalanine tyrosine metabolism complex so i'll quickly enumerate the different disorders in the phenylalanine tyrosine complex without going into the details just for a recall the phenylalanine normally metabolized to tyrosine by the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase when the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase is deficient we get the classical type of phenylalanine also known as the phenylalanine type 1 
for this reaction we require the uh, coenzyme cofactors the tetrahydrobiopterin which is reduced to dihydrobiopterin and then recycle to the tetrahydrobiopterin sometimes the defect is in the cofactor part and this is also known as phenylpinuria but malignant type which is further subdivided into four type 2 3 4 and 5 depending on the type of enzyme which is involved not going into the details tyrosine is then metabolized to the hydroxyphenyl pyruvate by the enzyme the tyrosine amino transferase deficiency of the enzyme is known as tyrosinemia type 2 also known as the richner hanhart syndrome the richner hanhart syndrome the hydroxyphenyl pyruvate is then converted to the homogentisate by the enzyme hydroxyphenylpyruvate oxidase now here there can be two type of disorders one when the enzyme is not there when the enzyme is not there there is deficiency of the enzyme the neutral tyrosinemia also known as tyrosinemia type 3 it is very mild most of the patients are asymptomatic rarely you can have some on mental retardation sometimes the enzyme is defective when the enzyme is defective the metabolism stops in between and the final product is not formed and in that case uh, we have uh, the defective enzyme is in there the homogentisate is then converted to the fumaryl acetoacetate and this was the enzyme that we're talking about the homogentisate oxidase the condition we said is known as the l captonuria Finally, the fumarate acetoacetate is converted to fumarate and acetoacetate. The enzyme which is used here is fumarate acetoacetate hydrolase. Deficiency gives rise to the tyrosinemia type 1, which is the most severe type of tyrosinemia, also known as tyrosinosis. Right? And here, what happens? The liver and kidney are affected. So, it is also known as the hepatorenal tyrosinemia. The defect in the enzyme gives rise to a intermediate called Hawkinson and the condition is known as Hawkinsonuria. Normally it is not mentioned in the list of the phenylalanine tyrosine complex because it is not due to deficiency of the enzyme rather it is due to a defective enzyme. So remember the Hawkinsonuria is also part of the phenylalanine tyrosine complex however the cause is not a deficiency or absence of enzyme rather it is due to a defective enzyme okay moving on to next question again about the proteins true about protein structure which of the following is true about the protein structure and these were the four statements which are provided secondary structure is decided by amino acid sequence now we know that this is false amino acid sequence will only determine the primary structure Tertiary structure is responsible for stability. This appears to be correct, but let us look at the other options. Sulfide bond is present in the secondary structure of protein. In secondary structure of protein, we only have non, we only have the non-covalent bonds. And obviously, sulfide bond is a covalent bond. So, it cannot be a part of the secondary structure. So, sulfide bond will be there in the tertiary or the quaternary structure, not in the secondary structure. Primary structure is lost on heating or denaturation is also incorrect. On heating, only the secondary, tertiary and the quaternary structure is lost. We know this. So, this statement is also correct. Not correct. So, the correct statement is tertiary structure is responsible for stability, which is the answer for this question. Next question bilirubin in serum can be measured by now i have been saying this again and again certain analytes and the related tests are likely to land up in your exam bilirubin being one of them so bilirubin in serum is detected by the vandenberg test what about the other options which are given ehrlich reaction also known as the ehrlich aldehyde test can be used to identify urobilinogen or the porphobilinogen right the urobilinogen or the porphobilinogen the schlesinger reaction is used to identify urobilin the fochets reaction is used to identify the bile pigments 
meaning for the bilirubin. These three tests, the Ehrlich reaction, the Schlesinger reaction, the Pochitz reaction is commonly used for the urine sample. The Vandenberg test is commonly used for the serum sample. All right. Uh, when we say urine sample, most of these tests happen to be qualitative only. What do you mean by qualitative? They will tell us whether a substance is present or not. They will not tell us the quantity. They will only tell us whether the substance is present or not. So, these three tests in the urine are qualitative in nature. The Vandenberg reaction is a test for serum and most of the serum reactions are quantitative in nature. Sorry, most of the serum reactions are quantitative in nature. They will tell us the exact amount because we are also running standards and then we do the uh, uh, colorimetric estimation of the concentrations. Okay. Moving on to next question. Now we are moving to uh, the molecular biology. The amount of thymine in a given sample of DNA is 28 percent. What will be the amount of the guanine? in the same sample of DNA. Now, this is a very simple straightforward question based on what is known as Chargaff's rule. All of you know this. The Chargaff's rule has very simple two points. The adenine combines with thymine. The guanine combines with cytosine. That is why the amount of adenine will be equal to amount of thymine. The amount of guanine is equal to amount of cytosine. Now, question says the amount of thymine is 28 percent this means the amount of adenine is also 28 percent, right. Let us say the amount of the guanine is x, in that case amount of cytosine will also be x and when you add all of them total should be 100 percent. So, 100 percent should be equal to A plus T plus G plus C. This means it should be equal to 56 plus 2x. 56 plus 2x. In other words, 2x is equal to 100 minus 56, which is 44. Or x should be 22 percent. So, by simple elementary calculation, the answer should be 22 percent. The answer should be 22 percent. The question is based on the very basic rule which is known as the Chargaff rule. Chargaff rule tells us adenine equals thymine, guanine equals cytosine in double stranded DNA which is given in the question, right. Okay, let us move on. Again, a uh, question from the molecular biology, differential expression of B48 in the intestinal epithelial cells is due to which type of modification? Now, various modifications which can occur in terms of expression can be the modification of DNA, there can be the uh, RNA uh, splicing which is part of the post transcriptional modification in the nucleus. There can be uh, changes in the RNA in the cytoplasm which is called the RNA editing and sometimes there can be uh, interference by uh, the micro and the silencing RNA. Alright, so these are the various options which can occur. The RNA interference by micro and silencing RNA. The RNA splicing is a part of post transcriptional modification occurring inside the nucleus. Right, the DNA processing also occurring in the nucleus and RNA editing occurring in the cytoplasm. Now, if you look at the messenger RNA, in case of epithelial cells as well as liver cells, once it is released from the nucleus, we have the same messenger RNA for both the cells, meaning the uh, splicing and the DNA processing which is occurring in the two tissues is the same, there is no difference. Now, we are left with RNA interference and RNA editing. Now, RNA interference, the action of RNA interference is decrease in amount of protein. It does not change the type of protein. 
it only decreases the amount of protein which will be formed so again this cannot be the cause for b48 being formed from an rna which is going to give us the b100 so we are left with rna editing rna editing occurs in case of epithelial intestinal epithelial cells whereby if we have this messenger rna at about 48 percent of the length a stop codon is generated due to RNA editing. So when the translation occurs, only this part is translated. A smaller protein is formed due to translation of only 48% of the messenger RNA called the B48 apolipoprotein. If all of the RNA is translated, we get the B100 protein. If only 48% is translated, we get the B48 protein. Remember, 48 doesn't denote the mass, it denotes what percentage of RNA has been translated. Okay. Moving on, which of the following is the etiology of Werner syndrome? Now, Werner syndrome is one of the types of early aging syndrome now this is one of those questions which i say you need not know the answer because these questions will come rarely sometimes uh, always one question two question five questions are there which is beyond the scope of our discussion so even if you don't know it doesn't matter much but just give you the answer Werner syndrome is a type of early aging syndrome where there is defect in the dna helicase gene as a result, we get the defective DNA helicase and early aging will occur. So, answer in this case will be DNA helicase defect. Now, again another question from molecular biology, which of the following drugs act by inhibiting DNA replication? I am sure most of you know the answer to this question. It is 6-mercaptopurine, 6-mercaptopurine. So, purine and pyrimidine analogs can interfere with the DNA synthesis by getting incorporated into the DNA but preventing the further elongation of the polynucleotide. So, purine, pyrimidine and logs will be common uh, molecules which can inhibit the DNA replication. Another question was there talking about the molecules which inhibit the transcription that is formation of RNA from the DNA and the various options were rifampicin, natrofurin, ciprofloxacin, novobiosin. Now this is a somewhat uncommon question so I will give you the small list of molecules which are commonly used and which interfere with the transcription. In prokaryotes, uh, some uh, inhibitors will bind with the beta subunit of the RNA polymerase. In prokaryotes, the RNA polymerase commonly has five subunits, two copies of alpha, two copies of beta known as beta and beta dash and the omega. So, these molecules are binding to the beta subunit. They are binding to the beta subunit resulting in prevention of the polymerase from attaching to the DNA. Rifampicin, streptovaricin, streptoglagidin, heparin and rifamycin. These are the drugs which bind to the beta subunit. Some molecules can also attach to the DNA and prevent the polymerase from interacting with the DNA. An example is actinomycin D, also known as dactinomycin. Now, is there any important example of a molecule which inhibits transcription in the eukaryotes? Yes, the answer is alpha amanitin obtained from the mushroom amanita phyllodes you read in pharma and it inhibits the RNA polymerase. 2 to a significant extent it also inhibits polymerase 1 and 3 but their inhibition is less the most prominent inhibition is for RNA polymerase 2 which is the more important type of polymerase for the eukaryotes okay so that's about inhibition of transcription now we go to the domain of vitamins lots of questions came from vitamins focused on only two of the vitamins so we'll quickly take a look at which all questions were there from the vitamins First question, vitamin B12 cyanocobalamin is found in, please note vitamin B12 is produced only by bacteria. As a result, the B12 is found only in animal food, it is not found in the plant food. If, if you look at the different options, only one option is animal food, rest all plant, plant, plant. So, it will not have vitamin B12, the answer is animal product. In plant food, you can have B12, only one condition. 
contaminated by infection for example there is uh, uh, fungi in infecting the uh, crop in that case you can have some amount of vitamin b12 okay otherwise b12 will not be there in the uh, plant food long you can see a very long clinical question 30 year old woman comes with complaint of easy fatigability exertional dyspnea and weight loss she also complains of frequent fall frequent fall is commonly due to some sort of neurological deficit okay the easy fatigability can have multiple causes let's see physical examination revealed that there was bilateral decrease in vibration sense again we are looking at some sort of neurological deficit hemoglobin level was 8.2 so anemia can explain the fatigability the exertional dyspnea and the weight loss she was treated with a folate supplementation they must have seen the purple smear which would show the show the megaloblastic anemia and that's why the folate supplementation was given and the anemia thereafter improved but the neurological symptom worsened now we know the megaloblastic anemia can be because of two reasons folate deficiency and b12 deficiency because b12 is required for regeneration of folate if b12 is not there we have what is known as folate trap the folate is there but not in the active form so it cannot be used b12 deficiency will also result in neurological damage because it is required for some reactions in the lipid formation which help in the stabilization of the neurons now if the neurological deficit is increasing on folate supplementation we are obviously looking at b12 deficiency which is getting aggravated so folate therapy caused use of b12 stores aggravating the symptom should be the correct answer in this case folate not absorbed if it do not absorb then anemia would not improve not correct pyridoxine deficiency not related to the neurological deficit deficiency of folate reductase in the cns unlikely to be the cause folate therapy caused use of b12 stores aggravating symptoms another question 50 year old man presents with paresthesia neurological deficit hemoglobin 6.8 anemia peripheral smear shows macrocytosis macrocytosis means we are looking at megaloblastic anemia neutrophils with hypersegmented nuclei endoscopy reveals a trophic gastritis what is the role of gastritis in any of the vitamin absorption the stomach produces the intrinsic factor intrinsic factor which is required to attach b12 and help in absorption so intrinsic factor will be produced by the stomach if there is atrophic gastritis intrinsic factor will not be produced b12 absorption cannot occur successfully so again the b12 deficiency is likely to be the cause in this patient three questions so far from vitamin b12 a young man met with motorbike accident that had injury to ileum and jejunum therefore the entire ileum and partial jejunum was resected which of the following is patient most likely to suffer from meaning which particular molecule is exclusively absorbed in the ileum again the answer is vitamin b12 once it attaches to the intrinsic factor the final absorption occurs in the ileum if whole ileum has been resected b12 will not get absorbed and it will result in a vitamin b12 deficiency four questions from b12 remember the water soluble vitamins b1 b2 b3 b5 uh, b6 b7 b9 and b12 these are the vitamins in the b complex they are very very frequently asked because of the associated clinical scenarios more questions from vitamin deficiency female on maize as a staple diet presents with history of diarrhea and necklace pattern lesion on the neck it is likely due to which vitamin deficiency now maize is rich in leucine and less amount of niacin both of them together result in niacin deficiency niacin that is vitamin b3 paradoxin please remember is b6 oh this option is missing 
I think it would be B9. I'm not sure. Maybe B9. Okay, so here the answer is niacin. We are looking at the classical necklace pattern lesion, which is known as the Kessal collar or Kessal necklace seen in the pellagra. Pellagra has the three Ds diarrhea, dermatitis, dementia. So, diarrhea is given, the dermatitis is given. Dementia has not been mentioned, but that is also seen. So, question 1 from Niacin. Question 2 image based. The Kessel collar has been shown in the diagram. This question was also there in the AIMS exam. They had given the image showing the Kessel collar or the Kessel necklace, and the question was asked what is the most likely cause for this presentation. So, again, the Niacin deficiency, Kessel collar or the Kessel necklace. So, I will quickly talk about Pellagra. The 3 Ds diarrhea, dermatitis, dementia and you can also have the glossitis. This glossitis resembles the glossitis in the A riboflavinosis. B2 deficiency also has the glossitis and stomatitis. If untreated, the 3D will merge to form a big D. This big D is death. The Casal collar or necklace, I told you, is due to the uh, pigmentation in the C3, C4 dermato. The C3, C4 dermato causes a severe pigmentation and uh, typically historically seen in populations which consume large amount of maize and sorghum because uh, the niacin is not available for absorption and uh, the content of the amino acid content uh, prevents the conversion of tryptophan to niacin whatever tryptophan is there cannot readily be converted to niacin due to high concentration of leucine Another question from vitamin, which vitamin in supraphysiologic dose causes macular edema and macular cyst? The answer again is niacin. So these were, you saw seven questions from what is all vitamins, four from B12 and three from B3 that is niacin. Which of the following clotting factor in a patient on warfarin therapy would have decreased gamma carboxyglutamate residue? Now, first you should ask yourself what will happen if there is warfarin therapy? Then we will look at the options. Warfarin therapy will inhibit the action of vitamin K. It will inhibit the action of vitamin K. Now, we can look what is the action of vitamin K, which of the following factors are undergoing carboxylation of the uh, glutamate residue and the answer should be 2, 7, 9, 10. These residues undergo gamma carboxylation with the help of vitamin K and if vitamin K is not there, these factors will be affected. They will not be able to act properly because the gamma carboxylation is required for the activation of these factors. So, these were the questions asked in the NEET exam, uh, two points to keep, uh, to understand from the NEET exam, large number of questions. We discussed I think uh, uh, 24 questions from the biochemistry section. I have left one or two questions which were overlapping with physiology and uh, the pathology. There was one uh, inheritance pattern shown for the autosomal dominant disorder and then one more question from physiology was there which overlaps with biochemistry, I have left that outside. So, large number of questions from biochemistry, 24 I have discussed, 2-3 more questions I could have included which uh, fall in the biochemistry section, number 1. Number 2, large emphasis on the vitamin section and super large emphasis on the clinical application of biochemistry. See, someone can argue that all of these are clinical cases, but you don't need the clinical knowledge to solve these questions if you know the basics of biochemistry. So, biochemistry continues to be very important to achieve a good score in your exam simply because if you know the question it is very easy to solve there is no scope for confusion the questions from back section are clear cut either you know it or you don't know it if you know it very likely to score high and a lot of students end up scoring in the range of 90 to 95 percent in the biochemistry section if you have done it properly so take care keep revising biochemistry and best of luck thank you very much